Hi there guys, I'm Joe Garth from Crytek, and in this tutorial I'm going to be showing you guys how to put together a scene like this in CryEngine. I'm going to be using pretty much every shortcut and every trick in the book to get this scene done in just a few hours. I'll be using kit bashing techniques for all the assets, and I'll be using Quixel Mega Scans and Endo and Dedo for the texturing. I'll also be making sure that the scene isn't so performance heavy, and that the assets that we're creating are going to be light enough to run on most machines. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using Quixel Suite 2. It's a really powerful automated texturing application that makes life way easier for artists. You can download a free trial at quixel.se. In this part, I'm going to be talking about asset creation. The first asset that we need to create for this scene is a simple sand dunes asset. For this, I'm going to create a plane in 3D Studio Max. Next, I'm going to set the length and width segments to 4x4. Four four. Next, you need to add an edit poly modifier on the top. Here, I've deformed the vertices a little bit to create this mountain at one end, and I've just sort of messed up the other vertices to give some interesting shapes. Next, I add a turbo smooth modifier on top of everything. This smoothens out the entire object and adds extra polygons. The more polygons you add here, the smoother it's going to look in the CryEngine, but at the trade-off of being less performant. Now for the fun part, I'm going to add a displacement modifier to the stack. If we choose displace, you can see that there's an option to add a map to the image section. The map we're going to add is called a gradient map. You can find the gradient map inside the slate material editor. Just simply drag and drop it in and then double click it to see its properties. You'll see that there are these gradient ramp parameters and you can double click that to create different keyframes. Within each keyframe, you can change the color value. You can also change the gradient type. For this, we're going to use linear gradients. You also have the option to change the interpolation of the gradients. This changes the curve in and out of a gradient key. Here you can see that I've created alternating keys of black and white, and they have the interpolation set to custom. This means that you can change the interpolation per key. On the white keys, I set the interpolation to linear, and on the black keys, I set it to ease in. This means that the peaks of the dunes have a nice crisp effect, and then the bases are a little bit smoother. The other parameter you're going to need is the noise amount. Here you can see I've set the noise amount to 0.1. If I zero that out, you can see that the lines are completely straight. Set it back to 0.1 and you get these cool wiggly lines going on that look like nature. There are also some more modifiers that I can add to add more noise and waviness to the asset. Here I've added a couple of wave modifiers and these give just a slight wavy feel. and then a noise as well. It's up to you how you dial in these parameters. It's not an exact science, so don't be afraid to just play around and try and find something that matches the image reference that you have in mind. This is the reference image of the sort of dunes that I was trying to create, uh, but you can obviously find a reference image of your own and, and create dunes with different settings. The very last step is to add an FFD box to the very top of the stack. This is so I can just take the sides and bring those down so that the middle of the asset gets a little bit more height than the rest of the asset. Once you're happy with all of your parameters, just have a quick look around and check there aren't any mistakes, and you should be pretty much good to go. The very last thing I'm going to check is my UVs to make sure that everything's completely flat. It should really just be a square. The next step is to build our spaceship. So to do that, I'm going to be using a method called kit bashing. This is where I take a library of pre-made assets and put those together a bit like Lego bricks to create a bigger asset. Here you can see all the various pieces included in the pack. It's basically miscellaneous science fiction parts. This is a kit bash pack that I use quite regularly. I think I got from Turbo Squid originally. Uh, you can find many of these kind of uh, packs on Gumroad or on Turbo Squid or CG Trader. 
Uh, just double check that they are, of course, royalty-free license. And of course, if you're building something for a game or a movie, double check that it's a royalty-free license and you can use it commercially. So here, I'm just kind of going through my kitbash pack and just seeing what are interesting shapes, interesting objects that I could perhaps use to start building out my ship. So I found a couple of really cool objects. Uh, one that already looks a bit like the front of a spaceship. I think it was probably intended to be a plasma cannon or something, or maybe some medical device, who knows. Um, but these these assets are just so generic and the shapes are just so sort of generic that, you know, it could be anything. It could be a weapon, it could be a tricorder, it could be a, a science fiction pistol. It's really just a case of playing around and finding the most interesting shapes and kind of putting them together and seeing what you can build out of it. It really is like Lego. So here I've sort of put together one section that I can use for the main section of my ship and one that I will use for the front. And this already gives me a pretty cool shape, I think. Just moving my kitbash library away and putting my spaceship right there in the center of the scene so that I can work on it. Whenever there are two objects intersecting together, you're bound to have something on the inside that just isn't necessary. So in that case, just go in and delete those vertices that aren't used. Here I'm kind of playing around with this crazy looking dragonfly wing. Uh, I couldn't get this to work in the end, but I thought it was pretty cool. It's really just about experimentation and just finding some interesting shapes at this point. So I decided to replace the sort of long pipes with more detailed weapons. In the end I sort of merged together two guns and deleted some parts from them uh, to create these sort of massive uh, blasters that they have on the side of the ship. I also just add some little components to sections just to add extra detail like this little wheel and some pipes, uh, just more high polygon detailed areas. So at this point I'm just trying to build up a high polygon spaceship. I don't care about topology or UV maps or any of that stuff. So really it's just about replacing those sort of general shapes with really just way more detailed stuff and populating everything. Here I'm just trying to align these pipes together and deleting the old low polygon looking pipes. Whenever there's some excess polygons, just delete them. And I'm always going back into the collection just to find new pieces that I can kind of use and slot into the design. I'm also just scaling and uh, moving objects around like crazy. I don't really care about uh, Transform or anything like that right now. So after about half an hour or so, this is what I came up with. So this will serve as a high polygon mesh. The next step that I'm going to go through is retopologizing this model because I want to try and get the polygon count down and I want to be able to UV map this really easy and quickly. With most kit bash kits you'll find online or pretty much any CG assets that you would buy, you'll find that the topology isn't necessarily the best for video games. Because 3D topology is basically a science of its own, I'll leave some resources in the description below so you guys know what to be shooting for when you create your models. Another thing to double check is that everything works fine with the symmetry modifier applied. You always want to be checking that your actual spaceship design looks cool from a bunch of different angles. So right here, I'm going to start retopologizing this mesh. So I'm going to choose this small asset here, this small little crate that's on the side of the ship. And I'm just going to select all of the different pieces of this mesh. Just make sure I get absolutely everything. You might have to move the camera around a bit and just sort of click around in a few pit places. The next step is to detach the object. Uh, you don't need to select clone, you can actually leave that off and hit OK, and then you'll have a separate object in the scene. I'm just going to hide all of the other pieces of geometry until you can only see this one asset. So the idea of retopologizing is to create a simplified version of this asset. 
So what I'm going to do is create a low poly version of this mesh and then bake normal maps onto this. The best way that I've found to do this is to isolate the bigger shapes and try to recreate the silhouettes of the, of the overall object. So right here I've got something that's quite a boxy shape, so I'll start off with a cube and I'll kind of box model a little bit around until I get the correct proportions. You might have to switch between local space and world space a little while manipulating the sides of the objects. So you can see here I'm just trying to fit the asset in and get it as close as I can to the general size of this crate. The next thing I'm going to do is add some edge, edge loops and use those edge loops to manipulate the sides of the box. So this is really just typical box modeling and I'm just using this to try and fit the shape. So you can see here there are kind of these bars going down and I want to try to get my edge loop to match with that. And again I'm splitting down and creating another edge loop, creating two edge loops. And just adjusting the parameters there so that they sort of coincide with these two uh, hanging bits. just extruding out these polygons. And because these are relatively simple operations, I don't really have to do very much in terms of modeling, actually. It's really just a case of uh, getting the basic shapes and the topology, as long as you use these basic operations, it's, it, the topology is usually going to be pretty clean, uh, with very little to clean up afterwards. And the idea is, of course, to use as minimum amount of polygons as you possibly can. Uh, because everything's going to get, all of the details are going to get reprojected in the normal maps anyway. So with this, it's really just a case of trying to get the silhouettes down. The silhouettes are way more important than putting any kind of surface details on there. With this kind of method, you can get your stuff to run on even the worst of machines or consoles or you know perhaps VR. When it comes to optimizing for VR, I'm pretty much using this exact method all the time. Once you've got the basic silhouettes down, you can start going in and adding chamfers to the edges where you think where you think they're necessary. And here I'm just replacing one of the some of those cylinders with slightly cheaper cylinders that will replace them. So yeah, that's only like an eight-sided cylinder instead of what we had before, which was this really complicated high polygon model. Obviously, from any sort of reasonable distance, you're never going to notice the difference, and it's it's really just wasted polygons if you have those high poly models there. Just adding chamfers to all of those edges where they're really visible and where I want the model to look kind of curvy. They don't have to be absolutely exact because X Normal does a really, really good job of baking everything down. Even if the mesh is a little bit off, X Normal is usually going to do a pretty good job of projecting it. Once I'm done with all my separate pieces, I attach them all together. And now I have my low poly geometry. So now we're done with the low poly, we can start to worry about the UV maps. So if I apply a checkerboard material to this, you can see that the maps are completely messed up. Uh, there's stretching everywhere, everything is inconsistent, and this isn't how it's supposed to look. The way it's supposed to look is basically a consistent checkerboard on all sides of the asset, and ideally it would also be a checkerboard in which you don't see any of the UV seams. So if I do a sort of basic flatten on this, you can see uh, that it automatically adds seams to all of the edges. Although now it looks pretty nice in that the checkerboard is way more consistent and there's less stretching. So the big issue here is that because there are these seams at the very obvious points, a program like ddo or endo, which does automatic texturing, isn't going to like these seams very much because they'll kind of get into the way of the automated process. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of the polygons on the sides that are facing us and sort of just choose the polygons that we can see exactly in front of the camera and then just uh, deselect any polygons that aren't directly in front of the camera. So the idea of this is just to try to move the seams away from the eyes of the viewer and put them in more sensible places, such as like tucked away behind the asset. So once you have all of those visible uh, faces selected, just go down to projection and click planar map. Once you have that, you can see as I kind of drag it away, you've got this whole section that's all one chunk with no seams at all. The only problem is that there's this stretching going on. To solve that, just do a quick peel. And you can see that what Max has done now with the peel function is it's created a best projection that it can get, basically, or best unwrap that it can possibly do uh, with the available seams. So that's basically map tra Max trying to sort of peel the uh, faces and automatically flatten everything down. So what you can do with this is you can just sort of play around with adding seams using the Edit Seams tool. Uh, you can see that down there in the right. Uh, and you can just see what effect that has on the peel. So just keep, keep clicking Quick Peel, or you can use the uh, Peel uh, tool. But usually I just click Quick Peel uh, to get instant results. It's always a good case to kind of look at your UV maps and then look back at your viewport and just see how uh, it's affecting the, uh, the checkerboard uh, as you apply uh, different seams to different areas. So here you can see that after I applied a seam to the front there, it's kind of straightened up all of the maps, which is quite nice. Uh, but of course, you don't usually want to have a dirty great big seam uh, right at the front of an asset. It's really just a case of finding a middle ground between the amount of uh, weird messed up stretchiness of your UV checkerboard and sort of the location that your seams are placed. The more obvious your seams are uh, and the more seams you place down, of course, the more, uh, more regular your checkerboard is going to be, but at the expense of having really visible seams. This section here underneath the asset, we're not even going to see at all. So I just lumped it together as one flat plane and then do a quick peel. And then I can pretty much just forget about it. Uh, you can also uh, go into an asset and, of course, uh, rotate the UVs around if you want to get the checkerboard to align properly. That's not really necessary because everything's going to get baked anyway. So whatever angle the checkerboard is at, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's more the kind of distortion and stretching that you want to really avoid. So you can see how it's kind of stretching a bit at the corners there. And I'm trying to find a solution for this by uh, putting different seams down. In the end, I put a seam right across the asset because I couldn't really get the corners to not have that stretchiness there. But it's just underneath the chamfer, so what's important is that the chamfered edges aren't on UV seams. Because if they are, a program like DDo is usually not going to understand that that's an edge, and you'll get some kind of a weird seam there. Obviously UV mapping takes a lot of time, and it's a bit of a science of its own. But don't let that deter you, and just keep at it until you understand the basics. And once you get the basics, everything becomes a lot easier. The best way to look at these sort of assets is to break them up into little tiny pieces and UV them separately. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people making is trying to connect multiple elements together into one sort of solid mesh. It's sometimes not really necessary and it can take a lot more time when it comes to retopology and UVing. So here's after about an hour or so just going through separating my ship into different elements and UVing each one separately. It's a bit quick and dirty and it's not a perfect unwrap or something. I'm probably not going to be proudly showing off my UV map to any game production artists anytime soon. But for a quick little scene like this, it's pretty much good enough to send to Didu. There is, however, a slight snag. Once you attach together all of these different objects that you've UV'd, you've got these UV maps that are all the correct size and they're all nicely flattened, but they're just a huge cluster in the center of the UV map. To fix that, go up to Tools and then choose Pack UVs, and you want to set it to Recursive Packing, 
Make sure that normalize clusters and rescale clusters is off and hit OK. Then you should end up with something like this. This is the result that you get when 3D Studio Max packs your UVs automatically. Obviously you'd get better results if you did this by hand and spend a long time organizing and laying out the UVs. So now we're at this point where our spaceship is low polygon. We've got 20,000 polygons right here and the UV maps are uh, flattened. Everything is done. And you can see here on the left, I've got my 20,000 po uh, polygon low poly mesh. And on the right, I've got the 200,000 high poly mesh. So the next step is to put the high poly and the low poly over the top of each other. And we're gonna save both of those out as uh, FBX or OBJ files, either or, it doesn't really matter which you choose. The next thing I'm gonna do is fire up X normal. And at the very top of the X normal menu, I'm going to click high definition meshes and add my high poly OBJ uh, or FBX up to you uh, to the list. And then go down to low definition meshes and do the same for your low poly. Then go to baking options and make sure that you take normal map and ambient occlusion and set the resolution to 4K. Leave all the other settings the same. Then just hit generate maps and you should get a normal map and an ambient occlusion map, which should look a bit like that. Because we want to bring this asset into DDoO, it's really important that we provide DDoO with a color map. So what you're gonna to need to do is make sure that you're set to scan line rendering and then hit zero on your keyboard to bring up the render to texture dialog. Make sure the mapping coordinates are set to existing channel and then scroll very, very far down to output and where it says target map slot, set it to diffuse color. Make sure that the width and the height are set to 4096, 4K resolution. We're gonna to go to the render setup again and go to render elements. And then you can, re you can add material ID as a render element and just hit okay and make sure it's enabled. Once that's done, just hit render in the render texture and you should get a color map, a color ID map that looks a bit like this. So now onto the fun part. Fire up your Photoshop and load the Quixel suite. And we're just gonna select DDo and 3Do. And in here we can now see the 3Do uh, viewport and the DDo tool configuration panel. We're not going to be using Endo for this tutorial. That's also a powerful tool, but we don't really need it for this. So I'm going to load my low polygon mesh, which I've saved out as an OBJ. And I'm also going to choose my color map and my normal map. And then lastly, my ambient occlusion map. So normal map and AO came from X normal and the material ID is from 3 Studio Max. Change the export target to CryEngine because that's the export that I'm gonna be using and then click the button, make art. I love that button. <laughs> so now DDo will start to create some maps and you can see it's doing all this really fancy stuff. <laughs> Not really sure how that works, but it does some awesome uh, stuff. And then, yeah, you can see your uh, asset loaded up in the 3D, uh, the 3D editor, uh, the th sorry, the 3D viewport, and you can start to tweak uh, all the lighting and all the stuff. And I actually really like how the lighting looks in the viewport in 3D. Uh, looks pretty awesome. Uh, everything's configured for PBR, and you can change between these various skyboxes, uh, which is quite a nice look, actually, out of the box. So the purpose of DDo is to make texturing way, way easier for an artist. To add a texture to this model, I'm just gonna hold down Shift and C, and that's gonna bring up my color map. Next, I'm just gonna click on one of the colors. So in this case, uh, this brown here. This menu will pop up that allows me to select a material and apply it to one of the material IDs. Give Dido a second and it's now baking out the uh, necessary layers in Photoshop. And bam, there we have it, the material that I selected from the menu. And the material already looks really nice out of the box and it's completely configured for PBR. 
It's got glossiness. It's got specularity uh, maps already configured. Uh, and I think it looks pretty cool. So this is after sort of fiddling around with various materials and applying them to my uh, model. And you can see that I've already got something that looks like it's like I've spent a lot of time texturing it, but I actually haven't. I've literally just pressed about three or four buttons and then uh, tweaked a few sliders. Uh, you can see if I zoom in a bit, you can see that I've got sort of all these kind of scratches and you know, kind of rust on top of the spaceship there, uh, which I didn't have to place manually at all. You can see all of the various layers that I'm using on the left side panel. Those are added automatically when you choose smart materials. In this part, I'm going to bring my spaceship and my sand dunes into CryEngine and start creating the scene. So the first step is to bring in my sand dunes mesh uh, into the FBX import. And here I'm just kind of looking around, seeing that everything renders correctly in CryEngine. And I'm just going to save that as a CGF. So behind, I've already created a new sort of blank level, and I've just put this uh, default anim object flagpole there. Uh, but I'm just going to drag and drop my sand dunes into this blank empty level. And you can see it's already looking nice and bumpy. Some cool little noise going on. So I'm just going to go up here into uh, level settings and uh, just check that the integrate objects is working correctly. Uh, because I plan to sort of integrate the sand dunes into the terrain uh, and sort of paint the terrain on top of them. So here I'm kind of painting on there and you can see that the uh, terrain uh, is now affecting that object. I'm just going to move it down a bit so that it's within the range uh, of the terrain integration. So the next step is to find a material for the sand. Uh, I'm just going to choose this sort of wavy sand material that we have here in the Quixel Megascan store. And I'm going to create a new terrain texture, call it dunes. And I'm also going to add a new terrain material. For the material, I'm just going to give it the textures that I've saved out of the out of Photoshop. And this is pretty much in the standard configuration. If you haven't seen the introduction to Megascans uh, forest tutorial, this is a really good tutorial if you want to just see how to import Megascans assets uh, as terrain uh, textures and uh, how to get those set up properly in CryEngine. But for this tutorial, I'm just going to focus more on sort of building out this scene. So you might notice that everything looks a very, very bumpy and dark. And part of the problem is that we don't have any kind of global illumination turned on. So to fix that, I'm just going to level settings and turning on the total illumination function and setting the integration mode to one. You can see that I'm again consulting my reference image there and just sort of thinking about the sort of uh, values and colors that I want to try to create in this scene. Here I'm just sort of placing the dunes some, somewhere interesting and kind of playing around with it. It's always easier to find the correct colors if you find like maybe a similar looking angle uh, to your reference image. Because we're going to be creating a physically based material, we're going to need to consult our physically based shading chart and make sure that our kind of our, our values are within the ballpark of what sand should be. So in this case, something like a low plastic or skin is probably closer to uh, what sand what sand should be. I'm just I'm just adjusting the diffuse color a little bit uh, to try and match my reference a little bit more. And here I can have full control over the specular color. For non-metals, it's usually best that the specular color remains completely grayscale. If you're not getting close to the reference color that you want, uh, try to get as close as you possibly can in the albedo and then look into other options. Usually it's not the case that the sun is too dark, but if it is, you can of course boost it. Always make sure that your sun is using real world values though, which means going no higher than 120,000 looks. A neat trick to try to get some brightness is to alter the film shoulder curve 
and use that to sort of just make things a little bit brighter. That's if your sun is already sort of maxed out and things aren't able to be brighter. Uh, here I just use the uh, use original diffuse map uh, toggle, which basically means that the terrain texture will take the original albedo uh, from the map. Here I'm just sort of messing around with the uh, different sand dunes and seeing what interesting shapes I can create from the asset. It's quite a versatile asset that I can just kind of tile and adjust uh, the size of uh, to make some interesting background shapes. It also sort of works in both directions uh, because of course the sun kind of affects it in different ways. So yeah, once I was happy with this sort of background, uh, I thought now is a perfect time to sort of bring in the uh, spaceship model. So here I'm just going in the FBX import and uh, bringing in my low poly FBX of the spaceship. And then just saving that as a CGF and bringing it into the scene. So here I just sped up this bit as I place the spaceship down in the sand and try to find some interesting shapes. At this point, finding an interesting composition is all about just sort of scooting around with the camera, moving things, uh, seeing what looks cool. And I kind of had this image in my mind about what I kind of wanted with this sort of crash spaceship. Uh, in the dunes, maybe kind of like in a hill somewhere. And I also saved out the texture maps for the spaceship and made a new material for those. Uh, made a new material for the spaceship. The spaceship is called the Puffin because I thought it looked a bit like a puffin for some reason. I have this weird thing ever since I played Halo that I really wanted to name every vehicle that I create by an animal. I just thought it was a really cool thing that they did. So that's applying the uh, normal map, uh, albedo, and the spec map. And you can see it already looks pretty decent in CryEngine out of the box. I didn't really have to tweak very much. Um, just set the specular color to full and the smoothness to full. And that means it's kind of utilizing the full range of those maps. Put a bit of a Dutch tilt on the camera, and then I'm just sort of moving around the assets and trying to configure them in an interesting way. I'm just copy-pasting the uh, dunes all the time. Uh, that's quite cool, I could get this sort of foreground dune. And the way that I have it is that the dunes sort of integrate into the terrain with the terrain integration function. So I'm sort of constantly painting and texture, uh, texturing the terrain and that's also uh, working on top of the dunes as well. I also added a sky dome to the background, that's pretty much just the uh, forest sky dome. You can find it in uh, the SDK and uh, in any uh, CryEngine SDK and SDK build. I wanted to create a bit more of a hill for the uh, spaceship to sort of crash down on and also just give it a bit more of a background too. And I'm constantly just adjusting the lighting and the colors uh, to sort of match my reference image. Here I added the volumetric fog to give a little bit of aerial perspective to the scene uh, and to make the distant background mountains look quite far away. Here I just wanted to add a decal for the sand to go on top of the spaceship. And that's pretty much just a normal uh, decal material. Uh, all, I need to, uh, all I need to do is just place the decal to project over the top of everything. And then in the material properties, you have control over the alpha fall off, the alpha multiplier, and the new angle based fading. So, again, I'm just sort of adjusting different things the fog, uh, moving some assets around, 
updating the train and playing around with the spaceship and its position. I wanted to try and show the top of the spaceship a little bit more because it was a bit more of a detailed area. And I just kind of set it down in the dunes. Just tweaking a bit the uh, sand decals to kind of match those in with the rest of the terrain. And also playing with different various textures for the sand. Uh, just adding different textures and seeing what they do, uh, seeing how they look. And trying to get this sort of perfect sanded look so that it looks like the sand has kind of built up on top of the spaceship. Uh, or that it's actually been there maybe quite a while, like it's been there all day or something and it's just kind of smoking and getting covered in, in dust. Of course, when the spaceship crashes, there's probably all this sand that's going to uh, fling up and cover the whole thing. Maybe you'd even smash through the dunes. I'm always just playing with different things, colors, lights, uh, materials. The real beauty of CryEngine is that you can just, uh, you can tweak any aspect of it anytime you want. Uh, and that's why it's, that's why it's really cool. Cause it's just real, it's all real time. So nothing's ever set in stone. Uh, you, you don't have to work in any, any certain order. Everything is just a, a nice little playground, a nice little sandbox. <laughs> You can see as I paint different materials down onto the uh, terrain texture, uh, the terrain integration handles that and actually takes the uh, terrain texture on top of the, the sand dunes asset. So here I'm going back into my Kitbash library and I'm just picking a few little props that I can use uh, to sort of scatter around the scene. So I've got this kind of cargo container here and these weird looking pipes all these kind of like mechanical things that I can just kind of stick out out of the sand dunes and sort of cover the surface with. So here I'm just sort of populating every little nook and cranny with little pieces of debris, trying to sort of fill the image with random little parts. I've also created a few new sand decals that I've uh, used to sort of cover the tops of these bits of debris, so they also look a bit sanded. I thought it was really cool to add one of the, one or two of these. Uh, sort of robotic looking chain parts uh, to the foreground to make it look a bit more like it's it's like a junkyard kind of feel like it's uh, like we're underneath some sort of big uh, shadowed object and we're looking out at the remains of this this ship. I also added a few of these dirt decals uh, which kind of helped to give a bit of a grimy look to the surface like there was maybe even more debris and broken parts that went flying everywhere. Maybe even some, some of these parts were hot and they kind of burn the sand. Uh, it just looks even more, looks even more burnt out basically. I also wanted to add some Megascans uh, volcanic rocks and I use these to pepper the midground with small rocks. So that's just a case of tweaking the vegetation uh, painting parameters until you get a kind of nice result there. In the end, I decided on sort of half as many rocks as that. I thought the left was a little bit empty, so I just put one more little prop on the left there. And then I'm basically just about done with this one. I hope this tutorial gives you some inspiration to create some epic artwork in CryEngine. Also, a big thanks to the guys over at Quixel that make speed art like this possible. As usual, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly. My details are in the description below. Achieved with CryEngine.